Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Muscle Podcast. Today, I'm uh, joined by Josh Henkin. Josh is really well known for sandbag training. We're gonna talk about the use of a sandbag and what, maybe how it's something that can really add to your uh, programming and add perhaps a unique stimulus, something different to what a lot of my guests have talked about in the past. So I'm really excited to find out a little bit more and it's gonna be a real education for me too. Josh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, my pleasure. It's good, great to talk to someone who's so good looking like, you know, the <laughs> bus, right? Anyone not watching this on audio, we're looking at two balded bearding men here. So <laughs> in, in, in strength conditioning, that's unheard of. It's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're bucking the trend there. <laughs> my pleasure. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, no, no problem at all. It's, it's, it's great to chat. Um, so, Joshua, first of all, sandbag. Now, there would be some of our listeners completely familiar with what's uh, involved there, what that is, how they might use it. And other people have maybe only ever trained in a, a big box gym, uh, and they, you know, or and they've never, they've never even seen one, let alone use one. Um, I was, I said off air beforehand. Presumably, this wasn't the first thing you ever picked up and started throwing around. How was your journey into training and moving towards, um, you know, be, becoming a leading expert in using them? Uh, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll try to give the shorter story. Um, basically, I started lifting when I was 14 with my older brother in a commercial gym, probably like a lot of people can relate to. I, I, had, I had just come off a really bad basketball injury. Uh, and so lifting was basically the only thing I could do. I had to torn up my right ankle. And so my brother got me in the gym. And, you know, so we did the typical upper body workout, especially chest, you know, right? You ha- first thing first thing I ever did was a bench press <laughs> yes. by the barbell. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as I often tell people, what I, what I instantly fell in love with is I knew in athletics I wasn't going to be the fastest, the quickest, the jumping the highest and so forth. And so at some level in athletics, like you hit an end point just because your physical ability is just, unfortunately, if you don't have the genes, you're not going to get there. Uh, but with strength training, it seemed like if you're always going to work hard, you're always going to get some benefit and you could always mm-hmm. keep making progress. So I think that was something that really drew me to it, that not being a gifted athlete, this is something... If I just worked hard, I could do. Now, of course, being 14, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, but, you know, I was very fortunate enough to have coaches early in my life that directed me. I, I often tell the story. I had a high school coach that actually introduced me to functional training in the 90, in the early 90s. Uh, so I had sort of a jump start, And he also taught me about this idea of strength conditioning. He was a strength conditioning coach for the Chicago White Sox, an assistant strength coach. So for baseball, so like this idea of strength conditioning and functional training and fitness education was something very, very early on before I even got to college that I was into. So I think that gave me a great jump start into everything. And then so I, I started lifting ever since I was 14, got to the, the university. Long story short, accidentally, in a weird way, end up walking onto the men's basketball team. Okay, That's a story for another time. Um, but, you know, during that time, I re-aggravated a back injury I had as a teenager and ended up my athletic career. And so, you know, I just was on a search for here. I was 20 years old. I was fit, but I was in horrible pain. I couldn't mm-hmm. sit in a classroom without like being in incredible pain. Couldn't walk around without being in pain. Uh, I, I had, you know, basically pain pills from the, the team doc that basically said, take them when you hurt. And I hurt all the time. So I'm popping pain pills all the time. Right. But, um, so I, I decided to get into strength conditioning because I still want to be involved in athletics. So I started working at the university with some strength conditioning coaches, started learning what it was like working with athletes. And our strength coach at the time had a big powerlifting background. So he was kind of biased towards that type of model. Uh, I, I saw things at the time that I wasn't sure, like didn't look right, but I didn't have enough experience or knowledge to say what that was. Um, so it just, it just stimulated my interest in learning more. So I just continued this to go at, and intern and work and, and study under coaches that did a broad types of training. So at the end of the day, you know, about 2002, uh, I was working, I was being mentored by a coach and he's like, Hey, check out this kettlebell stuff. And I'm like, I go on online and I'm like, by the way, that, that does date me, right? How old I am. Right? <laughs> um, and I look online and I go, kind of looks like what you can do with a dumbbell. I don't get it. And he goes, no, trust me, go the course. And this was the RKC run by Pavel Zatsulin at the time. Yes. And so I go to the course kind of reluctantly. And at the time, it was I was basically a poor post-college student. So like it was really cheap and I was able to get in. I like I just didn't eat for a week. It was fine. Um, but, I, but Pavel came out and the first thing I love what he said is that here we're, we're not going to teach you really kettlebells. We're here to show you how kettlebells teach movement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, oh, I've never heard someone phrase it that way. And so that really stimulated a whole different interest for me of like, well, 
maybe the stuff that I had seen because I had done strongman Olympic lifting and powerlifting and stuff like that. I'm like, but this idea of movement wasn't something that we talked a lot about. And, and what does that mean? And so, you know, really getting a lot from what Pavel taught us. Afterwards, I asked him, you know, where do I go from here? I want to learn more. This is not being taught in the university. This is not being taught in a lot of the courses. What do I do? He said, you got to read a lot of the old stuff. And so, fortunately, with the internet, you could read a lot of the old stuff. And, you know, anyone who's actually tried knows it's a little hard to read sometimes because English isn't really English, um, <laughs> you know, at times. But also more so, like, we have this false narrative that there was somehow this old-time strongman universal system of training. Mm-hmm. which wasn't the case at all. They all yeah. had very different ways of training, depending upon region, what they did, their backgrounds, and so forth. But you could extrapolate some things that were kind of interesting. And even though they didn't have the science that we do today, certain things they were definitely on the right track with. And so in relationship to sandbags, I always noticed that every lifter in one form or another talked about odd objects. Mm-hmm. And they said yes. it built the type of strength you couldn't build just with barbells. And I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. I've never heard someone ever say that before because up to that point, every the, the barbell was the pinnacle of strength training. Like, if you want to get strong, you use the barbell. And so, you know, being a former athlete, I said, you know, just reading what they said, they, they all seemed to say a sandbag-like tool was the hardest thing you could lift. So that's what I want to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I did the old, I mean, this is 2003, four, and I, I got the army duffel bag, got the duct tape, got the garbage bags and made my own 80-pound sandbag. And someone who had experience lifting, I'm like, eight pounds isn't going to be that hard. But it kicked my butt mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for that time, right? Uh, and so basically, I did what any good coach did. I said, I'm going to bring this to all my clients. So I'd gotten into private fitness at that point because I'm like, well, it doesn't seem like strength coaches make a lot of money. So let's go into fitness. Yeah. That, that was a great move. Um, mm-hmm. But like, so, so I started working with my clients and they loved it at first because it was a novel stimulus, right? It was something different. And so after a few months go by, you know, we run into this problem of going, what are we training, using this to achieve, right? I mean, the novelty eventually wears off on any tool. So you have to go like, what are we benefiting from this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm like, I I couldn't tell you really. And so I knew something positive was happening with people because they were getting stronger in other lifts, but I could, I mean, I just went with the old time strongman idea of like, well, it's building stabilizers, which is kind of a vague thing to say, but I sat down and and I really thought about it. I go, man, you know, sandbags aren't new and the internet loves to tell me I didn't invent sandbags, which I appreciate. I never claimed I did. Um, (laughs) and, And I go, okay, well, here's a tool that's always been around, but why hasn't it been the focus or something that's been strongly used in strength training programs? if everyone knows about it and mm-hmm. apparent and at the time you could just make out of a duffel bag. Right. So it wasn't expensive, but people still didn't want to use it. And I came down to like basically three points, either the, the tool is flawed. The way we use the tool doesn't work or both. Mm-hmm. And I really started to believe that it was both, but I didn't really have a way to solve that. So I sort of like, at the time, I thought sandbags were just going to be a novelty. I just had worked through at one point in my career and wasn't going to see again. Until a buddy of mine, and as I often say, everyone's got this buddy that knows somebody. Uh, he said, if you were going to make your own, what would you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not an equipment guy. I don't make things. I'm just a coach. And I said, well, I would do this. I would do that. And about a week or two later, I get a call from this guy and goes, hey, your buddy Nick says uh, you want to make a sandbag. And what are you thinking? I go, okay, well, this is what I'm thinking. And and then, uh, you know, in the mail, a couple weeks later, I get my first ultimate sandbag. And I'm like, it's like, I, he's, now he's like almost having your kid born. Like, you're just like, it's so exciting. Like, you open this package and, oh my God, this thing I created is right here. Because there wasn't anything on the market at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, there wasn't a fitness sandbag. Um, and so I looked at it and I'm like, okay, this is great. Like we, we changed, we started bringing in elements that weren't there before. Like we were starting to standardize size. We were start we added handles that do very specific things. Um, and, and, and we started like looking at like, Hey, we want a specific way to fill this implement because this is something we can talk about, but in, people really misunderstand stability and instability. Instability needs to be incremental, just like you would a load or volume. And so when something is drastically unstable, the research shows it doesn't benefit people. That's why the whole staying on unstable objects really doesn't transfer to much strength training or strength. Uh, so 
we wanted to sort of go like, well, how do we make this modular where we could change the weight, but that change the weight also alters other variables. So it became a process. I owned a gym at the time and started working with my clients to go, hey, if we do this, then this happens. And so what we started to do is building a system. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, here I had the tool, but then I said the other part was how are we going to use it? Because at the time with that duffel bag, I used it probably like most people. I just said, I'm just going to use this like an alternative barbell. Yeah. Right? And because I tried to find every book I could on Samex, I, I had no intention of inventing anything, but there wasn't much there. There just wasn't much content. And it, in retrospect, it makes kind of sense because I, I don't think of another tool that wasn't specifically designed for fitness that has a system to it. Right? There's not a rock system out there that I know about, right? Or a log, you know, like you just chop logs. So we started like identifying variables that we needed to consider that were drastically different than the barbell. And then how are we going to program this in, in a way that makes sense that achieves a unique result? Because my belief system, even to this day, is when you decide to use a tool, you're deciding to use that tool because it does something better than any other tool. Right. It's like the exa- example I give is a, of a surgeon. Right. If you're getting surgery done, you don't want them to go, ah, give me a, a scalpel or clamp. It really doesn't matter. Like, no, you're like, oh, my God. Like, no, they matter. Uh, you know, we're one of the few industries where our tools, we say, don't matter. And that's, I think, a wrong way to go about things because our yes. tools are the ways we teach people. We're teaching them concepts <clears> and movements. So it's through that that we started. And that's why, you know, I started wanting to get away from the idea of sandbag training uh, because I'm like, if you say sandbag training, we don't go, hey, I'm doing barbell training, right? You say, oh, I'm doing bodybuilding, I'm doing powerlifting, I'm doing Olympic lifting, right? Sandbag training doesn't mean anything because there wasn't enough standardization in the implement and the system. So a friend of mine, Alan Cosgrove, uh, who's Scottish, by the way, uh, you know, talk about people that know cold stuff. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, he said, why don't you call it dynamic variable resistance training? And that's where our system of DVRT came from because we... Even now, I say people don't like sandbags. They like the way, what we do with them. They like the system that we provide them. Because I can give, you know, I'm not a handy person. So you can give me the fanciest tool set in the world, and I'll still screw something up building it. So the tools give you potential to do great things, but it's your intention and knowledge of the tool and what you're trying to accomplish that gives it power. So that's why we always lead with the education and not the tool. Because if I, I can give someone our ultimate sandbag, and they can use it horribly and achieve nothing. It's what are you going to do with it? So I don't know. Hopefully that was the shorter version of the long story, no, but no, I think that's that's really good, and it's gonna uh, it's touching on a lot of points and gonna uh, inform people that maybe weren't too aware of it, it as a tool. Um, now they've probably gotten their brain ticking over how they may be using it, and also wanting to know more from from yourself. But uh, just the point on the on the tool, I had Dan John on the show uh, just before Christmas, I believe. Anyway, we were talking in that about how. You know, the importance of the tool, picking the right tool for the right job and understanding the strengths and, and weaknesses of different Absolutely. tools. Uh, and, and one of the problems, and I'm sure you've come across this, is pe- people like they are the kettlebell guy. And like the kettlebell is the answer to everything. And I'm sure you've people have started using your, the ultimate sandbag and they're like, no, this is the answer to everything. And, and they they then it becomes almost like a religion in terms of it's this and if you don't think it's this, you're wrong. And that can be an issue. But it seems like you do a really good job of educating people in the, the front end, as you mentioned, to make sure they're aware that the, there's, there's loads of benefits here, but also it's it's not this and nothing else. Yeah, I mean, I think the way you avoid that kind of cult-like behavior from people is from leadership. So because I, by default, I'm the leader of what we do, um, you know, we've been always very adamant that, yes, it can do so many things, but it's not going to solve everything depending upon what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve through a specific exercise. And that's why we do, instead of saying this solves everything, we show how it's integrated with other tools because as you sort of mentioned, people get very emotional about their tools. And so instead of going, this is better than your tool, we go, this is how it can work with what you're already doing. And this is how it can fill in maybe some of the things you weren't doing. And that's how we've approached it with like strength conditioning coaches that are used to very specific methodologies. We go, listen, I'm not gonna take away what you're used to doing, but what if we added this to it? And so that, that seems to be a much better way to bridge people into, into your community. And I mean, you don't get the super crazy diehards, but I don't necessarily want that. I want people to, to really be aware of, uh, of what they're doing and be empowered by it, not become like worshiping what we do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So now let, let's go a little bit more into it. Can you start 
outlining some of the uh, you know what the benefits and what it's so great for, um, and 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 then we can maybe build build on that and start giving some examples of how it can benefit people different ways. Sure. I, I think one of the greatest things is that we get to explore the concept of progressive overload at a fuller extent. So the most foundational concept of strength training is progressive overload. And when I ask coaches at conferences, what does this mean? I'll usually hear something along the lines of, well, you have to add more load to an exercise to get stronger. And to a point that's true, but overload actually means stress. So intuitively, a lot of coaches do things like they'll change range of motion, they'll change rest intervals, they'll change reps. Those are all variables of progressive overload. And a lot of tools, I mean, can function off those type of concepts. But what we expand it to is we can change the position of the load. We can change your position of the body. We can change the point of motion you're working in. And we can even change the level of instability of the implement. So we've now given an opportunity to create overload more ways, which can sound overwhelming to some. But even if you just add one of the variables, it's going to allow you to create more solutions because it's the old thing. If you if you have a hammer, everything's a nail, yeah. right? So if you if you have a barbell, you're going to see things, and that's the only thing you have. You're going to see things in very specific ways, and that's because of the limitations of the implement. Mm -hmm. So if we can expand what the implement can do, then we have all these ways to create better solutions. So I always say a coach is basically a solution creator, right, or a problem solver. And so what we're doing is using exercise and a tool to solve whatever problem we've identified to match the goal. So we have that aspect. And through that, like one of the big things is, is the idea of challenging different planes of motion. So for example, when we move in life, we work in three planes of motion. There's a sagittal, which is front and back, up and down. There's frontal, which is side to side. And there's transverse, which is rotation. So if I'm walking, I'm using all three. Mm -hmm. I'm, if I walk straight ahead at you, I'm moving through the sagittal plane. I have to resist the frontal plane. Otherwise, you get a nice little model walk shake. And I work in opposite arm and leg, which creates some rotational forces. So something that we would consider super common, super day one thing walking, we use all three points of motion. Mm -hmm. Yet still to this day, 99.9% .9 of the programs I see, even from high elite sports training programs, are sagittal plane only. And the sagittal plane isn't a bad guy. It's just if you stop there, it becomes problematic. And this week opens up a whole bigger world. But the idea is that we can start actually programming and progressing planes of motion where almost no other program does. And then what that results in is we develop better strength that transfers to more things. We can improve mobility faster and we increase stability much faster. So we improve resilience and performance at a much higher level. So it's not just, oh, we're doing something novel. There's an actual benefit to doing that. And it's a very tangible benefit. So, you know, I always say the magic, you know, the old saying, uh, magic is a science we don't understand yet. Um, you know, so it's, it's basically that when you, when you show people the result, they're like, oh my God, this magic. It's like, no, this is science. We just brought the science to life because this implement allows us to do this. Yes. And I would say the last really unique variable, or there's two, two more variables. One is that we use the, the, the ultimate sandbag as actually a teaching implement. So what I mean by that is, most people think of adding load as a way to add stress, and it does, but we're going to use load and how we grip and where we position the load to actually give you feedback because you know this as a coach. If someone's never done a movement and I'm just using verbal cueing on how to do it, there could be a gap in them understanding what it feels like. But if I can give them something that gives them the proprioceptive feedback to understand, oh, this is what you want me to do with my body. Oh, this is what you want me to feel then they're going to pick up on the movement faster and be more efficient and proficient at it. So we use the tool in that regard as well. We have very simple cues. I always have to say we, we have cues for mom and dad, not for like elite strength coach, right? Because that's who we're trying to help. Yes. And the last part is just the instability. So if, you know, I would say most people in our industry, if you said what's great about sandbags, they'd be like, in, they're unstable. But when I ask them, so what does that do? I don't get much of an answer. So what instability does is it challenges movement accuracy, right? So we got off machines because machines basically could create what call, what's called pattern overload. Because you're locked into a fixed pattern, you know, if I, for example, if I'm just locked into pressing like, you know, straight ahead and I just move my hands up slightly, I could have a deficit in strength and stability because I've pattern overload something very specific. Now, bar, now free weights give you a better version of that, but barbells are very, are, are more stable than dumbbells, right? So you take away something of that 
So it's having a very deliberate way that we use that instability too. It's not just, you know, people have this idea that if they're going to do something unstable, they just want to see if how unbalanced they can be. That's not the purpose of instability. It would be like, hey, you you lift, uh, you did lift 200 kilos on your first set. Now I'm going to make it 500 kilos. You'd be like, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But that's what people do to instability all the time. That's why people can't go from a bilateral deadlift to a single leg deadlift. Mm -hmm. It's yes. too big of a jump of instability. So I would say those are the primary benefits of it. And, you know, each one, when people experience it, they're like, oh, I get it. Like, that makes sense. But, it's, but the most difficult part is ha trying to encourage people to think differently. And, and because people, again, I, I mean, I, it's funny on social media when people get upset with me, like they try to attack the sandbag and they say something about the sandbag. I'm like, you're, you know, you're not upsetting me. It's an inanimate object, right? Like it, not getting upset over this. <laughs> Since I've been bad about my wife, my dogs, maybe we have an issue, but like not about my sandbag but people invest so much emotion into what they're doing that sometimes it blinds them from seeing better options mm -hmm. yes yeah that's very true i mean not only with the implements you know for example the ultimate sandbag but even i mean people get hit up about like body part splits or a training frequency whatever but it, it is I, mean, I suppose if we boil it all down most people are training to have some kind of uh change in their physique or uh and and that's a very emotional subject so we're going to be emotionally attached to to what we think works um and 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 that that showcased that when people start attacking the the implement that's quite funny though that i can imagine them just raging against the the implement oh yeah I mean, uh, that's right and, and the best example i try to i try to help people that are very much i go okay let's let's take fitness out for a second you're sick I have a medication, it can make you 50% better, which is better, right? Or I have a medication that can make you 80% better. Which one do you want? You're gonna pick the one that's 80%. Yeah. You, you just wanna get better. So let's detach ourselves from the methodologies, the programs, the tools, and go, what's gonna make me better to what I wanna become better at? And then, then you can make a, a better decision on what you wanna do, and that can sort of disarm some of the emotional attachments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Although it doesn't always work, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Well, of, of course not. No, no. but like I suppose uh, you know you can only approach it with logic and hope that people meet you somewhere along the, along the uh, yeah uh, that Appro journey. Approaching emotion with logic is a very hit and miss subject. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I'd like to explore instability a little bit. Um, so the way I often think about it is because um, people seem to confuse uh, strength and stability and they'll try and fix stability with strength perhaps. And I think there's a, a strength is maybe your ability to exert force and stability, if you think about it, is your ability to resist force to some extent. Um, and and it's obviously it seems to me that the, the sandbag will be great for that. And you talked about that movement accuracy and those micro corrections that you might need as composed, uh, compared, compared sorry, to being on a, on a machine. Now, do you have a, a sort of a definition of what stability or instability is? Um, and then and, and if you're trying to explain to people how we can utilize this tool to improve stability, how, how's, how's that explained to them and, and how, what's your thought process there? So just really fast, there's a difference between joint stability and whole body stability. So mm -hmm. what we're referring to is whole body stability, and which is okay. probably what most people should spend their energy upon. Um, and, and so I, I won't give you my definition, I'll give you one that I got from Dr. Bram Marcello, who's a high level performance expert. And he basically says stability is timing and sequencing a muscle activation. So something you said that's very relevant is that we, we still largely live, and I battle this even with professionals at very high levels, they think that an improvement stability means improving the strength of a muscle. That's not what stability is because your muscle can be strong, it could fire at the wrong time during a movement. So that's what stability is. It's basically motor control. How efficient are you in a movement pattern? So the reason we focus largely on movement patterns is because, you know, I think Gray Cook, who created FMS, says it very well. You know, you have your hardware and your software, and movement patterns are the perfect blend of both. Your hardware being your bones, your muscles, your structure, and your software being your nervous system. And your nervous system has a large impact upon your stability and motor control. So that's why we focus on mo movement patterns. So everything we do in our system is based on the seven movement patterns of squat, hip hinge, lunge, push, pull, rotation, locomotion. And within each of those exercises, there's so many levels you can move. But we have to first agree that those are the movement patterns. I'll give you an example where people go wrong. So it's very popular, instead of saying locomotion, it's saying carry, right? Carry is an exercise, locomotion is a movement, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it would be like saying deadlift instead of hip hinge. 
but a cowbell swing is also a hip hinge. So is a hip bridge. So it's the movement pattern. So we have to focus on the movement pattern because then we're going to look at what makes up that movement pattern. And that's how we're going to start addressing what level of stability do you need? Some people come in and they actually have good stability. So they can work at a higher level of the movement pattern versus someone who comes in who has very poor stability. They don't understand how to control their body within space. They don't move efficiently. So then we need to teach them at a more foundational level those concepts and they learn very quickly and then they have more success and they don't have the type of problems that a lot of people have when they start an exercise program. Did I answer that question? I forgot almost. Yeah, yeah, no. I, no, no. <laughs> I, got off, I may have gotten off track. De definition of stability and instability yeah. and, and, and how we apply it. I think that was um, that was really good. Uh, and the, the key thing, as you said, is the difference between a muscle can be strong, but the, the timing and therefore not necessarily doing its job to keep you in the position you want to be to, to some extent uh, is, is sort of how I was visualizing that. You can, uh, for, for something that springs to mind is, you see, people love their bands around there, do their glute activation work with that, right? And they could probably get their, their glute meads super strong, but then when they ask to, you know, you do, they're doing that lying down, for example, whatever, but when they're on two feet, standing up and actually having to resist some force and use that at the right time, that muscle that in theory has like huge capacity, um, uh, like lots of horsepower, doesn't deliver because the sequencing and that, that movement pattern's not there. Uh, and, and, and that seems to be something that in terms of people getting the, mis the, the, the disconnect between just pure strength and stability. Yeah, and that's a great example you gave because I think that's one for people that can they can easily visualize. So, you know, if someone says, oh, you got glute meat problem, they sit there and do band work, like there may be some benefit, like if you're post rehab, right? I'm not going to say there's zero, but if you're not coming from post rehab where, you know, something got damaged and that would just be in early phases of re-education, what you're like, people don't understand that muscle is not made to do that. Like I, the example I give is you can always go back to walking to help people understand things because we all walk, right? Imagine if you walked straight ahead, but you threw your leg out to the side as you did it. That's not what that muscle is supposed to do. The muscle is supposed to actually prevent your hips from deviating side to side. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was uh, Gary Gray, who's one of the fathers of functional training, said like well, a concept of functional training is the ability, ability to navigate gravity efficiently. And so like you were saying, if you're laying down on the ground, well, we can use the ground, but I don't like using it very much because we don't have a lot of gravity. We're not navigating ourselves through space. We're not learning how to control our bodies more efficiently. Now, all these concepts that you and I are sharing are un unfortunately very important, but not things people go to the gym and tend to accomplish, right? Now, I don't think anyone's ever said, today I'm going to work on my motor control, um, <laughs> you know, but, but it helps them achieve the goals that they say they want, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's when you educate people, it's like a barbell hip thrust actually doesn't make the glutes work better because the glutes work along with the thoracolumbar fascia of the core and the opposing lat. So if you don't integrate them, you can hypertrophy your glutes, but it doesn't mean the glutes are going to be functioning any better. I mean, to some extent they will, but not to the extent that people think. So that's why it's so, uh, it's so important for people to understand the body because you could be spending a lot of time on something that's actually not productive for the goals that you told me you have. And that's all I want to do for people. I, you tell me this is important to you. I'm going to try to give you the best strategy to accomplish it. It may include the bag. It may not. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So uh, you talked briefly about the hi about hypertrophy there, and maybe we can link something up here. For, so for uh, a lot of guys I work with, their goal is to look better naked, basically. And for them, that is to put on some size. They're naturally skinny. Sure, they want to be lean, but the key thing for them is putting some size. So hypertrophy is one of our key goals. And the way that a lot of you stuff you've talked about in terms of um, implementing it within my program is I quite often use what I call as a primer phase. And I just call it that because it gets a bit of buy-in as opposed to you know giving it a more boring name. But the point is this is going to set the scene for them to be in a position to get more out of training down the line. And one of the ways I, I often program things in that is we're doing some unilateral work, but we're also maybe moving, shifting center of mass to try and strain some stability. So uh, let me think of some, so for a split squat, most people do a, a Bulgarian split squat, for example, holding dumbbells. They probably have two dumbbells, or if they're only gonna hold one, they'd hold it in the hand opposite to the front leg. But quite often I'll get them to hold it in the same hand as the front leg because we're just shifting center of mass a little bit. And to some degree, I've, there's a stability challenge there and obviously base of support being on one leg. I can see that the ultimate sandbags is actually a tool that in this phase of training would be invaluable. And for me and my clients, getting buy-in will be letting, like linking up the dots or connecting the dots from, we're doing this now because it's going to build th these qualities and they will serve you well uh, d down the line when you know we're focusing maybe more on a, a bodybuilding type of thing. But this, we'll still probably keep weaving this into the program so that you're, you're keeping that capacity.
And one of the things when I'm looking in that prime phase is we're thinking about the, the you know, getting back to locomotion and you talked about the lat relationship with the glute and the thoracolumbar fascia. So we're talking about, you know, uh, anatomical slings. So the posterior oblique sling and the uh, anterior oblique sling. Now, when I'm talking to clients, I don't need to explain it to them like that, but strengthening these, the, these things and, and that more global movement I found it is, is actually fantastic for people whose goal is hypertrophy, uh, just, just packing on some size. And obviously athletic performance, I, I don't deal too much with people in that respect, but I can imagine it's even more important for them. So I, now, now we're wondering if I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be asking the question here, but I've gone a little bit ran, <laughs> That's okay, ramble. Okay, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you. Uh, I'm going a little bit ramble here, but there's, right. there's a couple of things you talked about and I was thinking, okay, cool, that, will, that resonates with my client base where I'm sure if I told a bunch of them, okay, what we're going to use is the ultimate sandbag, when they come in, they're thinking, oh, you know what, I'm doing cable flies, I'm doing uh, leg extensions because their goals are so focused with bodybuilding. But I think the point is that even with that goal, there's moments in time where you can get great value from these other tools and realize that your training now is is building what you've done in the past. It's facilitating what you're going to go and do, do in the future and, and take you towards that goal. Um, so I suppose a, lo a long way of going around about, about picking the right tool at the right time. Um, but that relationship between um, uh, posterior oblique sling, for example, I wanted to talk a bit, a little bit like, about that because I feel like this is a tool that actually could be phenomenal for people that, that struggle with that, and all they do is, you know, band work, uh, lying on the on, on the floor, and, and and hit bridges. Yeah, I mean, just just to the point of hypertrophy. So I I, ne I never the things that we've been talking about are not things I normally would tell talk to a client about. Uh, you know, we talk in terms of things that are relevant to them, right? So, you know, if someone's coming in for me for hypertrophy, I'm always going to frame things and how they benefit their goal of hypertrophy. Now, I may have other goals along with that, but they don't care. So it's it's a, it's a combination, as you well know, of, of giving them what they want along with what they need. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and phrasing it and explaining it in a way that they can easily wrap their heads around. So, you know, it, what, what is it? Um, Einstein said, great teachers can explain complex things simply. So, you know, when it comes to hypertrophy, I, I, you know, a lot of people, they, they look at the bodybuilding program because I did it as a kid, you know, especially, and you go, oh, this is the way I need to train for hypertrophy. And yet they don't realize that that's not a goal. That's not a program really made for them. That's made for mm -hmm. a, goal, a goal for someone who can dedicate their whole life to it and someone who may be cause, uh, pharmaceutically enhanced, yes. um, to put it lightly. And so the assumption becomes that we can't develop great hypertrophy hypertrophy through functional training, which I always find is interesting because if we break down what functional training means, it's in the namesake, improve the way you function. So you're going to tell me if I make you function at a higher level, you won't hypertrophy, you won't train a lot of muscles, right? So if I can, again, if I step back and go, you want to train one muscle, but you have over 600 in your body. What if I can give you an exercise that trains 30 muscles at once? Isn't that a better use of your time? You're telling me you won't hypertrophy from that? As long as we abide by the progressive overload principles, it doesn't make sense, right? If you look at gymnasts, if you look at wrestlers, if you look at martial artists, they all have physiques that I think most of us would be, very much appreciate having, right? And they do largely what would be considered more functionally based training. So I think it's just articulating in a way that makes sense to them. So in relation to the posterior oblique sling, like, yeah, it's, so for example, um, in a, in, a, in a classic dead bug exercise, for example, so if people don't know a dead bug, if you lie on your back and you have your arms straight up in the air, right over your chest, and your legs are bent off the ground, and basically you bring one arm over your head as you kick out one leg. And the idea of that is, you know, probably a lot of people have seen that, is, is core stability. And people don't know what that means. They just feel their abs and they think core stability. But what we're really trying to do is we're trying to get all 35 muscles of your core to fire synergistically to create what's called proximal stiffness. We want them to create that basically stable spine. But if you tell someone then, you get a lot of people doing a dead bug and they're just flailing all over the place. They're like, I don't know, oh, am I? And they feel stupid. And one of the biggest things people don't want to do is feel stupid in a gym. Uh, go, okay, well, how am I going to coach them? Because I hear, and I used to do it, right? All the funny cues that we as coaches give people. Squeeze your glutes, really? You walk down the street and go, you know what I haven't been doing is squeezing my glutes. Hold on a second, right? Or, or, you know, or, or feel your abs. Like, what does that mean? Like, that, that's useless. So in a case like that, where we would start people is we give them an ultimate sandbag, like a smaller one that has outside handles. So they are about a little wider than shoulder width apart. And we ask, ask them to try to break the handles apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what that does is that simple cue teaches them how to use their lats and actually, because of the loading, gets them to brace. 
So now we have a foundation. If they move their legs, their core knows how to be stable. Because if I say use your lats, brace your core, that's meaningless to them. But if I can use the implement to teach them what I want and give them a simple cue, just keep trying to break the handles, no saggy bag, they can understand that. And all they need to do, they become focused on the task. They don't understand maybe at the time that I'm also priming them to do the same thing when we hip hinge or when we squat or when we lunge, right? Or when we push or when we pull. But I know that. And so I'm just giving them skill sets that then will transfer over. So it makes them better at that particular exercise. But it's also giving them a reference point when I progress them of like, hey, remember that dead bug, how we had the last get tight because we pulled the handles apart? I need you to do that again, but now in this hip hinge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and when the, using the lats in that manner helps them, you know, start to get that posterior oblique sling, right? They're now training the lat, the core, and then we can start integrating more and more of the opposite hip. So we're doing it in a manner where it, all they do is they feel their abs and they're happy. They're like, oh, I feel my abs. Like it's working. It's feeling my abs. But I'm teaching them so much more. But, you know, I always say clients are on a need to know basis. If that client is having a little back pain, what I'm describing the benefits are slightly different because I got to tell them, hey, you know, one of the reasons you may be having a little back pain is through this chain. And, I, and there's a physical way to show them very easily how if you isolate the glutes, you're weak. If you integrate with the chain, and they're strong. So I go, if we can integrate that, that chain more efficiently, if we can wake up that chain, you may have less little back pain because your SI joint will be more stable. And after now, the, now you got, then you got to prove it. But in an exercise or two, I can then have them now retest and they're like, oh, I, I feel a little bit better. And so a lot of people come into exercise thinking it has to hurt. So if I can show you right up front two things that are super important, it doesn't have to hurt and you can do it. Those are major wins, mm -hmm. right? Because most people come to us not because they're too lean and too strong and look too good. They come to us because they're not doing the, they're, they're feeling like they th can't achieve those goals. They're usually self-conscious and cautious and so forth. And so they're like, kind of trusting us, kind of testing us, like, can you prove to me that this is something I can do? So if I can instantly build wins in through the use of a tool, using and what I'm doing, like you and I talk, we can have fun talking all these complex terms. But at the end of the day, if they go around and go, my back feels a little bit better, my, my hips feel a little bit more mobile, that's a huge win. And that's why I would get referrals is because people would have that type of experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know if that quite answered the posterior oblique sling, but that was kind of how I would go about doing it. We, we use the tool to teach how to connect those chains. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's great. Uh, a really nice way to explain it. Uh, whilst you were saying it also, I, I was thinking, I'm sure you get loads of clients who have like these, these massive uh, improvements um, and they don't realize that you've kind of thought of everything through to these levels of this, uh, this is going to influence that and, and yeah, that this will complement that blah, blah, blah. And they're just like, oh yeah, so I did some, I did some foam rolling and I feel great or whatever, you know, they'll, they'll attribute it to this one little thing. They don't realize that the whole program's been sort of designed, uh, you know, like this, this complex, beautiful mind type equation that's, uh, this, you know, you're, you're sort of running through and, and how it all feeds together. But um, yeah, I thought that was really nicely explained. And also as you were talking, it, um, we talked about hypertrophy and like functional training. Can you do it? It's, it seems like something that seems to be catching on and uh, as a bit of a uh, another sort of hot phrase is functional bodybuilding is, is something I see lots oh, of people. I haven't heard that one yet. Oh. Yeah, talking, talking, that. talking about that. Um, and I think it's maybe you know, to some extent, I think CrossFit influence guys who have left yeah. that, but they want to look good. Anyway, it's definitely, exactly. I don't, I don't know exactly, um, you know, what if, if there's a working definition of it. It's a phrase I've seen th thrown around there, but it, it just as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, this is this is probably something that's you're going to find that uh, maybe, maybe uh, lots of people start using it and talking about this great new functional bodybuilding tool they've discovered. But. <laughs> well, I mean, it's really interesting because we actually did have a university study. I thought this was you know, relevant to what we were talking about. So we didn't fund this study; we just were consulting on it. And uh, a study came out years ago, and it's funny. I thought it was going to blow people away, and then like people are like, eh. Um, so basically researchers had test subjects lunge cause you mentioned the lunge and I sort of thought of this and they were asked to hold dumbbells by their shoulders while they lunged. And so another group, so then they would do not the same day, but then they would do the sandbag on their fists, the same amount of weight, and they would do the same volume of lunging. Mm -hmm. So we removed the load aspect. We removed any volume changes. So if we believe what a lot of coaches say, the weight's just weight, you would expect no change in metabolic output or muscle activation. And what they found were significant differences in both of the sandbag. And it makes sense if you break down, hey, we have, it's not unstable because the weight's actually not moving. 
it's the ins- it's the compression upon my body that's being mm-hmm. created. The weight actually pressing down me causes me to brace harder and I'm having to work harder. So I'm getting more muscles active throughout my body, but I'm also expending more energy. So I was like, well, now here's the weird part. I just showed you the tools aren't all equal and the weight's not all equal. And yet people still fight me on that concept because they don't know what to do with that once it's actually been shown by science. There's other studies that aren't related to us that show something similar, not necessarily just the sandbag, but just like muscle activation and the need of stability. It's just, it's just because people, I know there's a difference between something being popular because that's what's familiar and something being popular because it's good. Yes. Right. So a lot of times people get stuck in that it's popular because it's familiar. Right. I'll give you a quick example. Something I always love is like, when coaches are like, well, I don't know if I want to buy from a, a equipment company, my my you know, a sandbag or whatever. I go, well, weird that you think of it as an equipment company, but okay. I go, but you do realize that barbell you had to buy at some point, right? Well, you have to have a barbell, but you had to buy it from somewhere. <laughs> you bought it from an equipment company, right? It's just priorities, right? It's just the perceived value of something. So that's why, you know, I don't talk tools, I talk what we're going to achieve with them. And so when you bring that to light to people, then they have to go through their own process. Like a lot of times people will watch us for quite some time on social media and they're like, now I decide to invest with you guys. Cause they just, sorry, you got, and I understand you got to build that trust up with people, mm-hmm. but it's like, that's why we lead everything with hows and whys, you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And very interesting about that study. I hadn't, I hadn't seen that, but, um, it, again, you know, he, he, in a similar vein, I sit, I quite often have people tell me, Oh, my, um, my quads are weak. Or my hamstrings are weak, right? And you're like, oh, okay, uh, tell me more. How's this? And then the, the explanation is, oh, well, on the leg extension, I can use this weight, and on leg curl, I can use that weight. And you're like, I mean, these are two very similar in many respects. They have a lot of similarities, these bits of equipment, but they are still vastly different. Like the lever arm on one, the calibration, except you, these things all play a role. So the the number that it's spitting out in terms of where you can put the pin is actually irrelevant. Like you know, you you, you can't base anything on that. And I suppose then for for someone that can't if, if they can't grasp that, the idea, of the, the difference between a, and a, and a sandbag and, and these dumbbells is just probably just it's, yeah. it's a leap way, way down the road for them. They'll 100%. get there in the end, perhaps. 100%, but, uh, 100% because, I mean, yeah, because I'm asking you to think about training so differently that I got to cross that bridge first before we get yeah. to the tool, yeah, right? Because yeah. if you're going to come at me with a, your, your, your preferred method is, let's say, powerlifting, you're not going to f- f- see value in what we do you, unless you're willing to think differently about how you train and how we can make them like i've worked with powerlifters and made them better but not by powerlifting so uh, you gotta be open to a different way and i always say when people are ready that's when they'll come to you if they're not yeah. ready then i can't make you do it mm-hmm. yes absolutely yeah i suppose you won't you'll be fighting an uphill battle if you feel like you're constantly having to justify it then it, you know they're, they're not going to succeed i mean uh just a, a, an overarching principle is the, the more spine and belief someone has in a program the better their results tend to be because they they put the requisite work in and that's yeah, regardless that's of the tool yeah. reg- regardless of, of the tool they've got to work hard so um now you talked uh, about load there in terms of that study that the load was the same now just out of interest you also mentioned at the start you used a, an 80 pound um sandbag and it kicked your ass when you first started loading wise what are we looking at with uh you know if someone's thinking they want to get uh you know the interest in find out a little bit more how how does loading work what what are the sort sure. of weight, weights you're looking at that's an awesome question and uh so our biggest challenge with people is they go i don't get it your stuff doesn't go heavy enough for me right and I, i'll give you a, i'll give you actually a specific story when a, a coach came up and goes i don't get your stuff how do you deadlift i'm like i don't get your question what do you mean how do we deadlift he goes well, I can deadlift, I think it was like 200 some kilos, right? And, you know, your bags don't go that heavy. How am I going to deadlift with your stuff? I go, well, we can change your body position. We can change the point of motion. We can change even where you're holding the weight and do a hip hinge. So you're only seeing the deadlift in the very broad, in the small scope. You're not seeing the movement pattern. You're seeing the exercise. So if I'm only going to see the exercise, yeah, we're going to be limited. But if I see the movement pattern, I have a ton more options than you do with that barbell. And it took him a while. Like his brain was like frying there because... I was asking him to think so differently about a question you asked me. So the answer to your question is, first thing is that people have to understand it's not going to be equivalent. So don't say, and we get all the time, and, and I understand people are trying to find some reference point, right? They'll be like, oh, I lift a 24 kilogram kettlebell, which bag should I get? Mm-hmm. The reason that it's problematic is because the bags offer something that's very, very unique, and that's related to the instability, which is dimension, Right. So we have different sizes, not just from a load capacity standpoint, but each size is going to be used slightly differently, 
right? Mm-hmm. And, to, and for certain exercises, one size works better than another. So there's another consideration there, which is opposite of, let's say, Olympic lifting or kettlebell sport, which tries to standardize the size so you don't change things, right? Yes. So we want that element. We want that as a teaching tool. So, you know, there's two sizes that we have, one called the power, one called the strength, are usually the two sizes. They're different dimensions. Uh, one, my, my kilos are a little bit off today, but like our, our power bag goes from about like 15 pounds up to 40. Our strength bag goes from 40 to about 70. Those are the starting points. And we actually ref- re- recommend people start on the wider end because, you know, if you're doing a, a corrective exercise, if you're doing a rotational exercise, if you're doing an unstable exercise, you may want a smaller bag that's more compact. And if you're doing, let's say, a more traditional lift, a clean and press, a row, you're going to want the bigger bags, uh, both for feedback and so forth. So in, in our world, if you're saying like, what's heavy, right? So if in our world, a heavy ultimate sandbag is like a hundred pound ultimate sandbag. Mm-hmm. And then if you go up to like 150, it, go, it doesn't go like when you go by 10 pounds or so, it's not 10 pounds. It feels like 20 to 30 pounds. Okay. Okay. Because it just, it's just so much more mass on you too. So, and, but it also depends how and where we're holding the weight. So I can make, so a old strongman concept because metal was very expensive at the time. So they didn't have all the weights that we have today. The a very big concept was how do you make a lightweight feel heavy? Yes. Right. So I can make a lightweight feel heavy a lot of different of the ways I'm sort of communicating to you. So if you said to me, what's the big disadvantage? And I, I don't know if this is a disadvantage or just a different way of thinking is we don't change the physical weight of our bags very much. For one, it's, it doesn't fit the nature of the tool very well, right? You can change the weight of our bags, but you're not going to do it like mid you know, set and go, yeah. I'm going to go up five pounds, <laughs> right? It's almost like from workout to workout or phase to phase or whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? So if we're not going to change the load, then how do I make it feel heavier and lighter? And that's why we have these other principles of how do I hold the weight? Where do I stand when I, how do I stand when I lift the weight? Which direction am I moving or resisting? So we do these other things and it's just, it's just different for people, right? You, you may not go to Facebook and go, I just improved 10 kilos a day. You know, like, no, no, that's, I mean, that can happen, but that's not the primary source of how we're going to progress a movement, right? So that, that's basically, I, I, hopefully that answers, but I mean, I'll kick people's butts and even advance people with a 15 pound sandbag. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. It just depends how I'm using it and what I'm trying to do with it. So yes, that's absolutely. why I try to like, that's why it's, it's so different in, in talking to people because I'm going to have to ask you to be open-minded enough to go, we're going to look at how we build strength a little bit differently and how we're going to challenge and progressions and regressions. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's an excellent point. I think if people recognize that, that you're trying to cham- uh, challenge or provide a stimulus and the, you know, the, the, the exact weight of one implement to another is, you know, is relative to that implement and recognize um, and understand the, the tool or the implement you're using and then uh, how you're trying to challenge the system. And as long as you are achieving that challenge, to many respects, the, the actual weight, whether you be using a kettlebell that's 24 kilos or a sandbag that's 15 pounds, if the, the, the challenge could be higher with a, a lighter load. Again, people are attached to, to the absolute load of something. I mean, you, your deadlift example made me think, uh, again, people that were sort of still struggling to get their head around that. If you had a guy who said, oh, why would I squat? I, I've got way more weight on the leg press. You'd think he was an idiot, or most people would. Uh, because they'd understand the differences and the loading, you know, why a squat you can't put a thousand pounds on. Well, unless you're the absolute top powerlifters out there. And, and to some extent that, that holds true uh, in terms of the example of deadlift into using an ultimate sandbag and, and, and the, the loading capacity being different. Yeah, squat is a talk- great example because and here's an easy example for people to wrap their heads around. And this would be an advanced squatting progression for us. And people don't think of it as advanced until I describe it to them. So I've had very strong squatters come to me and go, and almost say exactly what you said, right? I don't understand. Like, why do I? Well, number one, we don't put the load on the back because the, the implement doesn't work well for that and we don't need to do that. But if I put the load upon your shoulder and ask you to squat, I'm now making a sagittal plane dominant exercise, a squat, multi-planar. I'm asking mm-hmm. you to resist lateral and rotational forces. So when I have these really strong squatters take, let's say that 80 or hundred pound sandbag and put on their shoulder and I ask them to squat because my goal is they need to squat where they look symmetrical, even though they're asymmetrically loaded. Most times I would say 99.9% of the time, these dudes rotate their pelvis or laterally shift their pelvis. They cannot stabilize. So if I put them in the perfect environment, they're great. But if I Mm. change that environment, their strength changes. 
mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So this goes back on Dr. David Frost. I don't know if he's still at the University of Toronto. He studies a lot of firemen and tactical athletes. He had a great saying goes, what we want to do is keep the standard and change the condition. So keep the standard means the movement pattern. Change the condition means all these variables that we've been discussing. So if you can only be strong in one environment, are you really strong? Is the question I throw back to people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, that's why, yes, I can challenge you to a great degree. I, you're just going to have to work by the rules that we work by and not infiltrate another world's you know, w- rules. And just to your point about the kettlebell, like you were talking about, wait, I remember when I started kettlebells all those years ago, back when I was a kid. Um, and if you said, hey, I'm lifting a 24 kilogram kettlebell, no one in the gym knew if that was good or not. Because mm-hmm. not enough people had used kettlebells. As kettlebells gained popularity, and they and people gained awareness of, and because if I said, "Well, what do you do? You're gonna, I, I can bench, I can bench press more than 24 kilos. That's not heavy. I can deadlift more than 24 kilos. If I put that on my back, that's not heavy." But you're trying to use a kettlebell like something else. Now, if you use a kettlebell like a kettlebell, people start learning. Wow, that is challenging. That's kind of a challenging weight. So the same thing has to happen in our world, right? Like we've been around for 16 years. But it's been a much slower process because I said, if I call these Siberian sandbags, they made sell faster. <laughs> um, they, yes. They need the right story to them, right? But, like, it's the same thing when people experience it. Like, I, I've had a Olympic, a national-level Olympic lifter who can clean and jerk, like, over uh, 200 kilos. And he lifted up a 100-pound sandbag. It was like, wow, that's heavy. It's mm, just mm-hmm, different. Mm-hmm. And there's reasons it's different. But, again, it's just you have to first go in, like, what's my goal? If your goal is to back squat bag, we're not for you. Yeah. That's not what we do. Right. So it's it's like it, you're not going to benefit from what we do. And that and that's the reason I say that. So, you know, if I was just about selling you something, then I would just say, yeah, use it whatever you want. I don't care. Throw it, toss it. It doesn't matter. I want you to use it with purpose to get a benefit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. OK, that's perfect. I think that's a well, that's a pretty good a good wrap up, actually, there. Uh, a takeaway uh, for anyone listening. Um, now, before we do go, I have a, a few quick fire questions for you. And then I want to give you an opportunity to let everyone know where they can find out a bit more. Because I think there'll be plenty of people now who are like, OK, this this is something I want to know more about. And I, I want to, well, you know, maybe they're not going to dive into your world just yet, but they want to investigate yeah, it. As you say, sure. t- Start, 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 sort of lurking on the uh, on the Instagram page and <laughs> not and much seeing... to look at, but we use other people too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the same principle with uh, mine. Um, yeah, so they'll start they'll start having a little uh, little look, dip their toe in the water, and, and then sure enough, they'll they'll get there in the end. So um, either or questions for you first of all, a little bit off um, off subject, but pizza or burger? Ooh, I, I'm gonna say pizza. Okay, uh, chocolate or peanut butter. You're, I mean, the best thing is to combine the worlds, but if you're coming, <laughs> I almost have to say peanut butter. Okay, interesting. Yeah, most most people, well, particularly guys over in North America, like you know, states and Canada, they're like, well, just put them together. But uh, that, that, that's why <laughs> we're I thought greedy. Good... We're greedy over here. Exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, I agree to be honest there, but that's why that's why it's a tricky question, right? Um, okay, beach holiday or a city break? Ooh, I would say city break. Okay, um, steak rare or well done. Oh, you gotta go rare. You can't kill the yeah. meat again. You can't kill it's twice. Correct. Yeah, correct is the correct answer. Uh, eggs scrambled or poached? Ooh, that's a good one. I go poached. Okay. Now, uh, can you tell me something about you that people probably don't already know? Oh uh, wow! This is this is the one that's... in person. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> they don't know about me. I, I mean, I think I think a lot of people don't. Uh, it's funny when people meet me in person. They're like, I didn't realize you were that tall. Okay. Um, I, I, well, how, how, how I'm 6'3". I'm 6'3", 6'4", okay. in a good day. I'm not like crazy tall, but like, you know, because of video and, mm-hmm. you know, people like, they don't have a frame of reference, like, oh, you're a lot taller. So when I tell, and then the fact that I played college basketball, I'll tell you a really quick story. I know we're short in time. I was at a conference and, and I was talking to a couple friends and this one friend knew me, but he didn't know that I played college basketball. We were in Germany, actually. And we're like in the back of the conference. So someone's presenting. And I said, and my, my other buddy goes, oh, you know, Josh played college basketball. My buddy goes, no effing way so loud that like everyone turns around. I'm like, thanks for thinking I'm not that athletic. But yeah, I think that's probably the, the funniest part that most people don't, don't, don't see me because they don't have proportions to video. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so you, you're probably around about the same height as me. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of 6'3". We'd like to, if anyone asks, I'll tell them. I'm we got to get our team together. But that's it. But, um, but I don't know. I'm not sure actually if people would be surprised with my height in person. I'll, I'll have to ask uh, about that. Um, they, they generally tell me I'm even uglier in person as well. <laughs> well, you, um, the women tell me that, but that's <laughs> Yeah. So final question from me is if I could interview anyone, who should I interview next? Oh, wow. 
I would say um, Robert Dos Remedios. Okay, cool. He's known as Coach Dos. Yeah. Um, fast guy li- with tons of experience. I used to listen to him on a podcast years ago. He's, uh, what well, we're talking about, um, like functional movement, screens, FMS, maybe, I think. Was he on the strength? He used to have a, yeah. a little slot on yeah, the coach. strength coach. No problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, okay, cool. I will, a fascinating uh, guy with tons of experience and information. I'll add him to the list. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Josh. So, um, as, as I said, I'd love uh, for you to take a little moment to give people um, you know, any links or places they can find out more uh, if, if they want to you know, start thinking, how can I uh, in, get involved um, w- with you and what you, what you offer? So please, so uh, please we, let us know. I appreciate it. And we really do hit and lead with education. We give tons of free stuff. So on our blog at dvrtfitness.com that we update almost daily, um, we have tons of free information so people can spend a lot of time reading there. If you want to know about a specific topic, you're always welcome to email us to the website. We can direct you to specific blogs and so forth. Uh, on Instagram, we have several accounts. Our ultimate sandbag is kind of our company page um, with lots of information. We go over progressions and concepts. Uh, mine is Josh Hinkin, at, uh, Josh Hinkin DVRT. Um, you, like I said, we use a lot of other people. It just gives us another outlet. And then my wife's a physical therapist, so she does more of the corrective route. Uh, hers is just bento underline physiotherapist. Uh, so, you know, we, tr- we give so many opportunities for people to learn because when people say, you know, you guys want me to buy a sandbag, I go, yes, because we believe in what we do. Uh, but we also want you to use it for a very specific purpose. So unfortunately, there's a lot of bad information out there. So we try to lead with a lot of good information. And we you run sales all the time. And if people have questions on the right size for them, for what they're trying to do, our, we're really good. We have awesome staff that can answer all those questions. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure the uh, the links to all of those are in the show notes. So uh, for me, that's that's it, Josh. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to chat. It's been very, very interesting. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I always appreciate it. That wraps up today's episode. Thank you so much for investing your time with us. We really appreciate it. If you enjoyed what you heard and took value from it, please do me a favor by heading to iTunes right now, subscribing to the show and leaving a review. Positive reviews you know, like five stars, hint, hint, really help the ranking of the show and will help us to spread the word and keep getting top class guests on. Make sure to follow Breaking Muscle on social media and me at Tom McCormick, that's T-O-M-M-A-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K on Instagram. Bye for now and I'm looking forward to catching you on the next episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast.